All right, let me just repeat that. Um, yeah. Let me finish this, and if you do it. Um, naturalism, and guys, I, I know this may not be the most exciting thing in the world, but it's what we're doing today, so just bear with me. All right, so naturalism, we're saying, is people were victims of circumstances beyond their control. And three of those circumstances are your psychology, evolution, socialism, Tory, Darwin, and Marx. Think about it. With psychology, your psyche, who you are, was determined by your parents, particularly your mother and her relationship with you. Evolution, human beings exist, not because we chose to, or not because God did anything about it, but that life just evolved, it moved on its own, without any input by us. And the same thing is true with socialism or communism. The history is moving in a direction. And uh, it's just like inevitable that it's going to move in this direction we have no control over. So we're going to read a story called uh, An Occurrence at Our Creek Bridge. I've got one more little story i got to tell you. When I was in the fifth grade, I went and visited a friend of mine. And we spent the night on Saturday, uh, Friday night. And at 9 o'clock on Friday night, um, every Friday night, you can still see reruns of this on TV, the Twilight Zone came out. And it was real scary, and uh, it wouldn't be to you, and it wouldn't be to most people today, but you know, when, at that age, at that time, it was kind of scary to watch it. Well, for this particular night, I don't remember when it was, um, but for this particular night, they, they kind of changed their normal show, because they did their own uh, filming of their own stories and so forth. But this, this night, they showed somebody else's story. And the name of the story was An Occurrence at Alfred Creek Bridge. I'm not going to tell you what it was about. You'll find out in just a minute. But it, it actually won an Academy Award, I think, for a, a, a short, you know, they have these obscure awards for short movies that no one's ever heard of. But this was actually very good. If you can find it online, I can't. I can't find the full version of it. Um, but it's a remake of this story. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to ask uh, Ben to start reading for us here. Um, there's actually three parts to this. In the movie, it's, it's just one part. Here, go ahead. In the movie, there's just one part. It starts at the beginning, and it moves to the end. But in the book, there are three parts. So Ben's going to start. Um, and uh, we'll see how much we can get done before we leave. So you may begin. A man stood up on the railroad bridge in northern Alabama, looking down into the swift waters of the people. The man's hands were behind his back, the rest were bound with the cord. A rope closely encircled his neck. It was attached to a stout cross chamber above his head, and the slack fell to the level of his knees. Some loose boards laid up upon the ties supporting the rails of the railway to find a footing for him and his executioners, two private soldiers of the Federal Army. Directed by a sergeant, 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 who in civil life may have been a deputy sheriff at a short remove upon the same temporary platform with an officer in the uniform. At the drink arm, he was a captain and sentinel at each end of the bridge, stood with his rifle in the position man of support. That is to say, vertical in front of the left shoulder, the hammer resting on the forearm, thrown straight across the chest. A formal and unnatural position, forcing an erect carriers of the body. Would you take your pencil and highlight or bracket what he just read, where it says a sentinel? That's a little bit of detail that I almost would say it's more detailed than you and I would probably like. That's another aspect of realism and naturalism is a almost like a photographic detail, you know, like the details you would find in a photograph. You take a picture of it, he's showing us exactly how the guy's holding the, the arm. Uh, we're not so sure that's important, but it's so typical of this kind of writing. Keep going. Um, all right, here it is. It did not appear to be the duty of these two men to know what was occurring at the center of the bridge. They merely blockaded the two ends of the front planking that traveled that traversed. Okay, uh, what are they doing to this guy? Basically, they're hanging it. Basically, on a bridge, 
and um, he's already got the noose around his neck, and uh, they're getting ready to to, to do that. Uh, Robbie, do you mind reading the next paragraph? Beyond all of the symbols, nobody was in sight. The railroad ran a straight way to put forth in particular, and curving was lost to view. Do doubtless, there was an outpost farther along. The other bank of the stream was open ground, and it was sloped out to this stockade of vertical trees, loophole, loop, loopholes for rifles with a single embrasure through which protruded the muzzle of a basket. They didn't ask you this. They asked you question number one, and you can answer that. We just did that. But I'm, I'm adding this. Uh, he's totally surrounded. He's in the middle of the bridge somewhere. Uh, of course, when they hang him, he'll be hanging over the bridge. I guess they'll cut him down. I don't know if they just let him float down the river. Um, but he's surrounded. You got on either end of the bridge, there's their sentinels, their guys with guns. Uh, right above them, there's a, uh, there's a say, a company. And I think that the company that that are um, they got their weapons. Um, it, and it, it mentions that th this is a execution, so it's very dignified. All right. So um, why don't you pick it up? There. Where do we Right. Where do we left off? No. The man who was engaged in being hanged was apparently about thirty-five years of age. He was a civilian, if one might judge from his habit, which is that of a planter. His features were good. His straight nose, firm mouth, broad forehead, from which his long, dark hair was pulled straight back, falling behind his ears to the collar of his well fit or his well fitting frock. He wore a mustache and a pointed beard, but no whiskers. His eyes were large and dark gray, and he had a kindly expression which one hardly would have expected from in one whose neck was in the hem. Evidently, this was no vulgar assassin. It's a liberal military. Code, makes provisions for hanging many kinds of persons, and gentlemen are not excluded. Uh, circle some things. He's a planter, which means he owns a plantation. It means he's pretty wealthy. <laughs> Teddy had a um, kindly expression. Circle that. And he said, this is no vulgar assassin. So he seemed like he's just a regular guy that for some reason, we don't know what that reason is yet, um, they decided to hang. All right. I talked Preparations being complete, he brought the soldiers to the side of the industry away from the lane upon which he had been standing. The sergeant turned to the captain, saluted, and placed himself immediately behind the officer, who in turn moved apart one pace. His movements left the condemned man and the sergeant standing on the two ends of the same plank, who spanned three of the cross ties of the bridge. The end upon which the civilian stood almost, but not quite, reached the floor. This plank had been held in place by the weight of the captain. It was now held by that of the sergeant. At a signal from the foreman, the latter would step aside to the plank of tail and 
So the way they got the deal, he's standing on one end, the sergeant is, and Peyton Farquhar, which is his name, is standing on the other end. So the sergeant, or whoever else, I think at one point they switch, they switch people. He will stand, he will, you know, stand off the board, and of course the weight of, of the man with him being hanged uh, will cause him to fall and be hanged. All right. So why don't we go to um, Jackson? See what happens. There. He closed his eyes in order to fix his his last thoughts upon his wife and children. And the water touched her gold revived the early sun. The breathing in the mist under the banks at some distance down the stream. The, the fort, the soldiers, the piece of drift. All had a striking. And now he became the conscience of many disturbance. Striking through through and through of his of his dear ones was sound. She had, which he could, which he could neither ignore nor nor understand. The sharp, the sharp, distinct metallic precision, like the stroke of a blacksmith's hammer upon the upon the anvil. He had the same ringing quality. He wondered what it was, and whether, and whether, and whether he knew a distant or nearby its same bow. His reverence was was regular. As slow as the as, as the torn of a of a dead man, he he awaited each new stroke with impatience, and he knew not why it impressed him. The apprehension, apprehension. The, the intervals of silence grew progressively mm -hmm. longer, and the delays became maddening. With a greater infrequency, the sounds increased in strength and sharpness. They hurt his ear like the. Like the trust of the knife, he feared he was shrink when he heard it was the, the ticking of the watch. Um, so he hears this sound, he can't, uh, he can't figure out what it is, and it's simply the ticking of his watch. Um, I, I wonder why the author put that little detail in. Remember the guy's seconds, maybe, minutes away from dying. I wonder why. Find me a little bit of that poem. I saw, I heard a fly oh, buzz when I died. Yeah, where, you know, none of us have been in that situation, but things are exaggerated, and maybe the smallest details are exaggerated. A fly, uh, here it is, a ticking of a watch. So I'll finish it. He unclosed his eyes and saw again the water boiling. <clears throat> if I could free my hands, he thought, I might throw off the noose and spring into the stream. <laughs> By diving, I could avoid the woods and swimming vigorously reach the bank, take to the woods and get away home. My home, thank God, is as yet outside the woods. My wife and little ones are still beyond the invaders' farthest advance. As these thoughts, which have here, which have here to be set down in words, were flashed into the doomed man's brain, rather than evolved from the captain, rather than evolved from it, the captain nodded to the sergeant. The sergeant stepped aside. Hey, what? What is question number two on your sheet? What does the sergeant did. What does he do? What does that mean? I just demonstrated for you what he was going to do. He stepped aside. What does that mean? He stepped aside what? He stepped off the plane that the, on the other end of which they were balancing themselves. The other end was the man with the rope running in there. So he steps off that. Um, and it ends. We know what happens next, right? The guy's going to be hanged. Um, notice, though, what he said right before what he thinks, right before he dies, he says, if I could free my hands, he thought, I might throw the noose off, spring into the stream. By diving, I could evade the bullets, swimming vigorously, reach the bank, take the woods, and get away home. My home, thank God, is yet outside their lines. My wife and little ones are still beyond the invaders. So it's amazing. Seconds before the inevitable happened, he's surrounded by troops. There's no way he can escape, but he's thinking of a way to escape. To me, that reminds us of, well, just in, in every human being, the desire to live. It doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter what condition our life is in. Uh, Mr. Willoughby, I think I may have mentioned it, his, his father uh, is in, in a... a Rest, rest on. I mean, he's his his, uh, his 
skill too, and so it's really hard. And um, you know, when, and I've heard people that are get that age, they want to be with their departed spouse. They want they they're kind of ready to die, and yet there was a moment that happened <laughs> where he felt in danger, and the first thing he did was pull the or press the button for help. So it's just sort of a natural thing. We say, yeah, we're ready to die, but when that moment comes. That the instinct for us is to live. So here's a guy. There's no way he can get away. He is truly a person, a victim of his circumstance, and you'll see that even more so in this next section. Um, but the last thing he's thinking about is, I if I only did this, if this happened, this might happen, and I could I could do this. So right, start. Uh, this is the background. This is what happened prior to this moment on the bridge. Okay, and Spark Kumar was a well sitting planner on the old highly respected outbound family. Being a slave owner and like other slave owners and politicians, he was naturally an original socialist and ardently devoted to the southern uh, circumstances of an imperious nature, which it is unnecessary to relate here, have prevented him from taking service with that gallant army which has fought the disastrous campaigns and made the, the fall of the court. And shaft under the inglorious restraint, longing for the release of his energies. The larger life of a soldier is an opportunity for distinction, that opportunity he felt the common that comes to all the world time. Meanwhile, he did what he could. No service was too humble for him to perform in the aid of the South. No adventure too perilous for him to undertake if it consistent with the character of a civilian who was a at heart a soldier who in good faith and without too much qualification assented to at least a part of the frankly villainous victim that always found love and war. Uh, we can sort of answer, we'll find out more about this. Uh, number three, we already said he's a, uh, a landowner, he's a planter or he's a plantation owner. Um, I think we may have to wait to get the details. I know what they are, but I'll let you read them. So we have a little more description of his family and his where his circumstances. But um, says he's a slave owner. Uh, he was a, a proponent of secession. So he wanted. He was a southerner. He was a Confederate. Um, so why is he fighting? Well, that's the right answer. We don't know. He doesn't tell. He just says something happened. And he couldn't do it. He wanted to. He wanted to be all fighting. That's really important to what happens next. He's a guy that couldn't fight for some reason, but he wanted to. He wanted to be with the, his brothers. He wanted to be fighting for the cause, but he couldn't. So with that in mind, Lillian, would you read it the next couple, maybe? One evening while Clark Carr and his wife were sitting on a rustic bench near the entrance of his ground, a gray-clad soldier rode up to the gate and asked for a drink of water. A Mrs. Barquar. It's probably Barquar. Barquar. That's like Q-U-A-R. Forget uh, the H. And was only too happy to serve him with her earned white hands. While she was fetching the water, her husband approached the dusty horseman and inquired eagerly for news from the front. The Yanks are repairing the railroad, said the man, and are getting ready for another. They have reached the Owl Creek Bridge, put it in order, and built a stockade on the north bank. The commandment was issued in order, which is posted everywhere, declaring that the civilian caught in hearing, interfering with the railroad, its bridges, tunnels, or trains will be sum summarily hanged. I saw the order. Well, there's some information there we need to know. Um, it's question number five. Um, describe the lone Confederate soldier who stopped at the farm. Uh, we can't answer all that yet. But I can tell you what he tells him. We can't answer the rest of it. we got to read the next section. But um, he says that the Yankees have not yet crossed the, the, the bridge and that they're, they're on the other side of the bridge and they are protecting the bridge. Um, and that any civilian caught interfering with the bridge, with the railroad that crosses the bridge, uh, will be hanged summarily, which means 
no trial. They're just taking the hand. Um, so uh, he's not that far from the bridge. Why would a southerner on this side of the bridge, if the Union Army was on the other side of the bridge, why would a southerner want to tamper with the bridge, burn it down with something like that? Why would he want to do that? Yeah, I mean, they're eventually going to figure out a way to get across it, but it does slow them down. It's, it's a military objective to destroy, well, burn your bridges. Haven't you heard that? You burn your bridges behind you so that the people chasing you won't get you. By the way, they're in Alabama. Um, so this is, this is near the end of the war. They're moving east. The army is against uh, the Confederate army. So we'll go to... Um, Jameson, and just, if you read just several of these, it's short dialogue. How far is it to the Owl, the Owl Creek Bridge for Fort Ass? About 30 miles. Is there no force on this side of the creek? Only a picket post half a mile out on the railroad and a single sentinel at this end of the bridge. Suppose a man, a, sil a, a sil civilian and student of hanging should elude the picket post and perhaps get the better of the sentinel, said Fort Ford. What could he accomplish? The soldier reflected. I was there a month ago, he replied. I observed the flood of last winter and the a great quantity of driftwood against the wooden pier at the end of the bridge. It is now dry and it would burn like tinder. The lady had now bought, brought the water which the, uh, which the soldier, the soldier drank. He thanked her so ceremoniously, bowed to her husband, and rode away. An hour later, after nightfall, he had passed the plantation going northward in the direction from which he had come. He was a federal scout. All right, so we can answer five. Um, he's dressed as a Confederate, but he's a federal scout. Um, and then number six, explain the trap the federal army is setting for Peyton and how it is a perfect candidate for us. So what if, what's going to happen if anybody tries to burn the bridge down? They're gonna, if they get caught, they're going to get hanged. So um, this guy's a federal scout, so they're, they're clearly luring him into doing just that. Um, why do you think he's a good candidate for that? They don't know this, but we do. Given his background, why is he somebody that might take that chance to go burn down the bridge? Yeah. Because he, he can't actually fight on the front line like he wants to, so yeah. he feels like he can do something against me. That's right, and I guess they figured that, since here's a guy that's not fighting, um, maybe we'll get him interested in doing something. Um, and so, uh, he's a perfect candidate, explain the trap, so they're trying to lure him in to try to burn the bridge down, which uh, they'll be waiting for him, and they'll try to uh, capture him. Again, notice what I said earlier, here's a great example of being circumstances uh, circumstance beyond his control. Peyton Farquhar doesn't know he's being set up. He's just reacting to the information that he's a victim. He's really a victim of their trap. So I think before we hear the announcement, we have some reading to do for Wednesday. It's on the board. Um, I'll be working on your quizzes to get back to you. Guys, listen, we will pick this up again on Thursday, um, but you need to make, make sure you're ready uh, Wednesday with the reading. Thank you.